Hello and welcome to assignment 2.2. We are going to be taking notes on the pink sheet, um, the one pink sheet that you have for unit two, which is the age of exploration. You were given those while you were in school. If you don't have one, scroll all the way down to the bottom and you will find very, the very, very bottom um, a link through Kami where you can do it digitally. Um, now, I'm not sure if you noticed, but I've put on a little instrumental music in the background to spice it up a little bit because we're talking about the Spice Islands, among other things. I don't know if you can hear it, but we'll see. Anyways, we have finished up the last lesson talking about Christopher Columbus and how he successfully sailed all the way around the world and reached India. Oh, actually, wait, he did not do that, but he thought he did. Um, he actually had reached the Americas not quite North America, but he had reached South America and the islands which he thought were the Indies, but now are known as the West Indies or the Caribbean, Bahamas, that area. Now, um, so these top notes should be filled in already, but if not, there they are. You can pause at any time and fill them in. You should have done it last time, but it's there. All right, now we're gonna be down here at the bottom why people explored the three G's, gold, God, and glory. And this is sort of their motivation for exploring. And later when we talk about the colonization, setting up colonies, the motivation again is going to be the three G's. A lot of times the motivation for anything in social studies can be boiled down to these three G's, gold, God, and glory, which are kind of big categories so we can kind of make anything fit in a way. So gold, God, and glory, what do we mean? Well, the first part is gold. Gold can mean the shiny stuff, but it can also just mean any economic reason. Gold can symbolize money, basically. That could be actual gold. It could be trade. Like in this case of Christopher Columbus, he is looking for a water route to Asia. Um, that was so they could dominate trade and make money that way. That is an economic or economic, if you prefer, a reason. Um, later on, we'll see the looking for raw materials, farmland, etc. But gold is means money, basically. Gold, God, and glory. Most explorers were searching for a water route to Asia so they could trade for spices, silk, etc. Later, they hope to find actual gold. Now, if you're filling in your notes, and it for the most part, the underlined words will fit in the blanks. Um, however, I will pause and put it up in a second with the actual note sheet if you want to wait for that. Um, so the, looking for a water route to Asia to replace the Silk Road, you know that the Silk Road was many different trading routes between Europe and Asia um, in order to bring the fine products from Asia that they had that they did not have, mostly spices um, such as ginger, nutmeg, um, cinnamon, peppers, vanilla, these were all cloves. All of these were highly valued by the Europeans at this time. Other goods would be like silk from China, porcelain, um, ivory, rubies, other things like that. So all of these things, these riches that they have over in Asia, um, and Columbus, remember, thinks he can sail around the world and reach these spice islands from there. So they're looking for a water route to Asia. Just get in their head looking for a water route to Asia. That's always a good reason. All right, the second one is going to be the God. This is really religious reasons at, the, for, at this time to spread religion, specifically the Roman Catholic religion, Christianity. The Columbus wants to spread, well, he is the king and queen of Spain, want him to, and he is in agreement to spread the Catholic religion. They feel like, it is their moral obligation, their duty. They have to help these people who do not have Christianity in their lives that he has to save them by doing bringing that to them. And then glory is really a big category that includes everything else. Becoming famous. Some people do things to become famous or just because it's an adventure to see what's on the other side of the mountain or see what's on the other side of the ocean. And of course, to claim land for their king or their country. Because remember, up here, these people, the church, the pope, the kings and queens, nobles, these people are better than us, and we want to win their praise. Um, 
if you're one of these lower people, you want to win their praise and have them look kindly upon you and maybe give you financial reward and maybe let you move up, giving you a title or something like that that can move you up this pyramid. So that would be the glory reason. Um, so this is just showing when Columbus is going ashore. Now, this is not a primary source. This was painted many years later, but you can see in the background here, they're hoisting the cross to represent it to represent Christianity claiming the land in the name of God. All right, now if you did not get the notes filled in yet, you can pause here. Actually, before you pause, let me explain one little thing. I sometimes get some questions about my handwriting. I try to write neat, and I think I do, but it's kind of, sometimes it falls into a sort of combination of printing and cursive. So I just want to point out a few letters. The most one, the worst habit I have when it comes to printing is this. This letter here it's a, is an F. And it doesn't look really like an F, but if you think of a cursive F, sort of looks like this. This is kind of a poor form of that. But if you see one of these, it's an F. Um, this is an L, a small L. That's sort of reasonable. This is a T. That's a small T. So thus, this is the word the. All right. Just thought that would be fun to know. All right, I will try to print neatly though. So now you can pause and fill in the notes if you have not done so. I'm not going to sit here. I'm just going to assume that you have now unpaused and you are back to live recording. Um, now, on the back of this page, if you flip your page over, there's always a back. As I flip my page over, you will see other explorers you need to know or should know. We are going to skip them for now. Don't cross them out. Don't draw a huge arrow. We will come back to these another day. But for now, we're going to scroll down to the page to the part that says reasons why the age of exploration exploration happened when it did and not before. So you think about the age of exploration. We generally say it starts in 1492. It's really the 1500s into the 1600s. Why? So the 1500s, 1600s, why then? Why not the 1100s, the 1200s, maybe the... 500s. Who knows? Why not some point in history before this? Well, really, like, for example, why not when Leif Erikson and the Vikings traveled to North America? Why didn't that set off the age of exploration? It's a complicated answer. We're going to simplify it a little bit. But the real short answer is that the world was just not ready for that yet. There was, when I say the world, I should stress, I don't really mean the world. The Western world, Europe, was not ready for it. China, on the other hand, may have been ready for it, but they weren't interested in it. They had explored. They decided there wasn't anything worth seeing. At least this is possibly, probably, maybe what happened. But we're talking about United States history, which means we have to start with Europe. That's what's going to lead to the United States. So Europe just wasn't really ready until 1492. And in 1492, all the conditions were right for this this Columbus's voyage to just set off this explosion, not literal explosion, but an explosion of exploration. So this we could simplify into the three T's. Really not a thing, but it fits here. So I, I had to stretch it a little bit with travels, but it's an easier way to remember the three T's. All right, trade, technology, and travels. Why the age of exploration happened when it did and not before. First up is trade. Now before 14, before the 1400s, you know, back in feudal times and stuff, there wasn't really a need or a desire to go to Asia or to go anywhere in the world because, as we talked about previously, people in Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire had kind of retreated to their little kingdoms and fiefdoms and weren't really knowledgeable about the rest of the world and didn't really care until after the Crusades. Then the Silk Road opens up, there's all this demand for goods, goods from Asia and the Spice Islands and China and India and Japan, and people want to cut out all the middlemen and find a water route there by sailing west is Columbus's idea, but of course he runs into North and South America. So earlier in history, people in Europe knew very little about Asia and had no reason to travel there. But by the 1400s, this had changed as a result of the Crusades. By this time, there, were, there was large demand for goods from Asia, and trade along the Silk Road was considered too slow, too expensive or costly, and too dangerous. So people wanted to find a water route. 
Next up is technology. Um, so much for my musical background, it led to a commercial. Don't want that. All right, so technology, another reason the world, and don't worry, I will give you a chance to fill in the notes just like I did before. Um, now, we might not think of the 1400s and 1500s as being the age of high tech, but it really was in lots of ways. Before this time, um, this vast ocean, even though they didn't know there was what was here, people could not really travel out to sea. It just wasn't feasible. It wasn't safe. They would sail around the Mediterranean, but once you left here for Europeans, if you got out into the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean or the Ocean Sea, as they used to call it, these were very rough seas. And if you've ever been out in the middle of a body of water when you can no longer see land, it's easy to get turned around and not know which direction is which. That could happen. Plus, they're boats. These little boats, the waves would knock them over. Boom, they're going to die. Plus, there's monsters. There's sea monsters out there, which in a way, there's whales, there's sharks, there's things like that. They're no match for these little boats. I mean, these boats are no match for them. Um, so really, it was almost suicidal to venture away from the shore. Now, most of the shipping that was done, most of the travel by sea, um, was done along the coasts. Leif Erikson and the Vikings traveled along the coasts. The Portuguese, when they start exploring, they're going to go along the coast to stay always keeping land in sight, because if you can see land, at least you know which direction you have to go. Whereas once you get out in the middle of the ocean, you cannot see land, you could be lost at sea forever or eaten by a monster. Um, now, a few pieces of technology come around and change that. One is these new high-tech ships that were developed. These are called caravels. And the caravels, I don't know anything about shipping, but from what I've read, um, there's some unique features about them, like these triangular sails that can be tilted that make it much easier to steer the ship. Um, and also the high, the high backs and fronts, which and, and the, something with the rudder that makes it much less likely to get knocked over when a wave comes along. They're, they may not, might not be the fastest ships in the world, but they're not going to get knocked over. You're not going to die, at least automatically. You have a much better chance of surviving out in the middle of the sea in one of these ships called a caravel. Secondly, better navigation tools. This is a compass, which compasses had existed, but they're starting to become better so you know which way is north, south, east, west, etc. Similarly, this is an astrolabe. I don't really know much about astrolabe, and this is a recreation, but uh, this one says 2007 on it. It's not an actual um, authentic one from that time period, but it's you would use it to measure basically lines of longitude, like we you know longitude and latitude. So this between these two things, that could give you a much better idea of where you are, how far you've traveled, etc. cetera. Um, so it was becoming easier to navigate. And lastly, but not least, maps were becoming much better. Um, this is a world map from 1154, and we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at it, but basically this here is Africa. This would be Italy sticking into the Mediterranean Sea right here. Over here is Spain. And that's the whole map of the world, 1154. 1490, jumping ahead, 1490, just before Columbus's voyage, a little bit better map of the world, maybe. Here is Africa over here. Here is Italy. If you follow the red dot, there's Italy. There's the Mediterranean Sea, of course. Now this is that ocean sea, the Atlantic Ocean, which uh, they don't really see what happens to it. They think the world is mostly covered by land, not mostly by water. Um, and But the world is small. Columbus thinks, boom, we can go around to come out right here very easy. Now, by 1520, there is maps are getting a little bit better still. Just for reference, here's Africa, Mediterranean, Italy over here. Now the Atlantic Ocean is getting bigger. They're still not sure what's out here, but it's getting getting closer. And then by 1570, we have a somewhat more realistic looking map of the world with the Atlantic Ocean here. This is North America. They still have not really explored North and South America, but they, 
besides the coast. They're getting a general picture of it, but not super accurate yet. Finally, another important one that has nothing to do with shipping or the ocean is the printing press. The printing press, movable print, um, allowed, now they had these in China before, but not in Europe. And um, a guy named Gutenberg gets credit for inventing it. He wasn't the only one, but the Gutenberg printing press um, with movable type allows books to be printed. Pages can be printed. It's kind of like a primitive um, copying machine. You put the letters, down. you'd have to lay out by hand the letters to each page that you're being printed and put ink on it. And then you'd, you'd pump or turn this thing to press the ink down onto the paper, which is why it's called the printing press. Now, this was a slow process, but compared to writing out by hand books and copying books by hand and stuff, it greatly improves the ability for books to be produced, which means that knowledge can be spread from one generation to the next. It's not just that if the person who has the knowledge dies, it's gone. Now, books can be written books, many more books can be printed. That means it's going to lead to more people being able to read. So knowledge spreads, just that that knowledge base of the population increases dramatically. And now when Columbus goes on his voyage, unlike what happened with Leif Erikson and the Vikings, when the news didn't really spread too much because there was no way for people to read about it, really. Same with Marco Polo. Now printing press is around when Columbus makes his voyage. And very quickly, lots of copies of books get printed describing the voyage, describing what he's seen. And the news spreads throughout Europe pretty quickly. So technology, and I'll read it to you quickly, but you can pause it. And I also have, uh, I have a sheet, I have the filled in notes if you prefer to my handwriting to this print. During the 1400s and 1500s, improving technology made travel by sea faster and safer such as these examples, better ships, caravels, better navigation tools, compass, astrolabe, and better maps, and better knowledge, meaning the printing press enabled learning and knowledge to spread to more people and be added to more easily because you can take what other people have learned, you add your knowledge in it, then somebody else can take that and combine it with more knowledge. So the knowledge base keeps increasing. Lastly, um, Travels. Travels is a stretch, really, but the development of the printing press and Europe's new interest in learning that came with it. This was a time period time period called the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance was a time period. Remember, a lot of the knowledge of Europe, Western Europe, had kind of disappeared with the fall of the Roman Empire, and then there was the Dark Ages and stuff and feudalism. Now, people in the uh, there's not an exact date, but roughly the 1400s-ish, 1500s, people in Europe become fascinated with learning again. There's this interest in rediscovering the knowledge of the past, the classical knowledge of ancient Rome and ancient Greece and things like that. And, and books play a big part in that, that people can now read these histories and things like that. Um, this is a time period when there's a lot of interest in art and science, um, Michelangelo is at work in the Renaissance, as is Leonardo da Vinci. So there's this base of not there's the interest in learning and knowledge and being curious about the world. Um, so the development of the printing press and Europe's new interest in learning, aka the Renaissance, if you've ever been to a Renaissance fair, that's where that word we're talking about, help make people aware of travels by people such as Marco Polo and then later Columbus. People now are interested in learning about them and learning about other places. This led to even more interest in competition to discover new lands. No previous travels by people such as Leif Erikson and Vikings and maybe others were mostly unknown because there just wasn't that curiosity, there wasn't that interest, there wasn't that ability to print it. All right, so to fill in the notes here, you can pause. Um, and if you, I'm going to assume you did pause and now we're going again. Um, one last thing I'm going to mention at the end of this video is to give you a little bonus because I noticed some people don't watch all the way to the end of the video. And I want to give you some a reward besides the reward of knowledge, some more reward for making it to the end. And because we're talking about travel by sea and the ocean and because 
the god of the the Roman gods of the god of the ocean was Neptune or Poseidon. One of them was Greek, but anyways, both of them were always pictured with one of these things, a trident. This is their weapon. And because I happen, as I record this, I happen to have a pack of gum sitting on my desk, and it happens to be trident gum. So your free knowledge and bonus points for your quiz, which if you don't watch the end of this video, you won't know the answer. But because you are, you will. That doesn't make sense, but here's the knowledge. The word trident comes from the Latin word. Now, this thing is called a trident, and gum is called a trident. Trident's from a Latin word, tridens, or tridentis, which means tri means three, dentes means teeth, three teeth, thus one, two, three teeth on this weapon, or the three prongs. Why Trident chose that name for their gum is a mystery. You don't need to know that. All right, um, that's it. Thank you, and come back again. Um...